I know it when I see it. A threshold test for obscenity and gentrification. The obscenity of a gentrified neighborhood starts subtle. First, it's a Trader Joe's. Next, a Starbucks. Maybe even a Target. Your rent goes up, then utilities, and before long, property values have increased because the local businesses are replaced by artisanal peanut butter sandwich shops, or at the homeless shelter turned rooftop bar serving bottomless mimosas, where the murals made by those who once lived there now painted over in eggshell white, lit by sconces and offending fluorescence, made empty by the land taxes raised from the Whole Foods across the street, and the kumquat coffee bar so overpriced it makes some walk two extra blocks for Starbucks, In the neighborhood once vibrant with music, now coveted by only the most affluent hipsters. All to line the pockets of corporate landowners and investors with their own government's blessing. Gentrification commonly describes the whitewashing and cultural appropriation of Black, Brown, and Indigenous people of color. But the practice is much more nefarious in its erasure of historically underserved neighborhoods. Its controversy is so widespread, it's now depicted in the entertainment industry, illustrating the real-class struggles of residents who experience the gentrification process. But these stories usually have a happy ending, with the collective action of residents wielding enough political power to combat the process before it takes effect. The reality is, once areas start to gentrify, it's nearly impossible to keep its original neighborhood intact. A gentrified neighborhood likely includes mixed-use developments with commercial and residential spaces, interfacing with arterial road corridors with tree-lined parkways and sidewalks. Modern international architecture styles signify new or renovated spaces. Some areas may focus on pedestrian and transit-oriented developments and other prominent design strategies of contemporary urbanism. The coalescing of buildings, infrastructure, and communal spaces vary by city, but a community usually receives the rubber stamp of gentrification when big box retailers and franchises enter the area. Ethnic restaurants or artisanal shops reflecting the composition of pre-gentrified neighborhoods may be deliberately recreated, but the residents who originally shaped the identity of these communities have been removed. What was once known as a cultural hub for local artists, historic district, or designated low-income neighborhood, is now home to a privileged class of individuals who moved in for work, but can also afford to live in these exclusive, high-priced, inner-city enclaves. In its most perverse form, gentrification is the corporate takeover of real estate, exclusively benefiting the ruling and landowning class. This practice invokes the tenets of commodity fetishism, conforming individual socioeconomic status to their material surroundings. Gentrification requires a class of wealthy consumers who feel inclined to enter these renovated areas. Because American culture, if ever there were such a thing, is rooted in hyperconsumerism, we seek to procure the most desirable products and commodities as the possession of these items are in and of themselves status symbols. Highly desirable urban neighborhoods satiates this affinity for materialism. As long as this affinity to materialism is embedded in our urban neighborhoods, individuals will enter gentrified spaces, not as a collection of residents with shared values, customs, or communal practices, but a collection of spenders. We tend to focus our attention on class conflict resulting from gentrification because it's the physical manifestation of the process itself. The process of gentrification is the result of the state representing the interests of the capitalist, landowning, ruling class over the working, renting, disempowered class. The federal government's land allocation practices during settler colonialism created the foundation from which gentrification has developed. Land rights were only granted to select individuals, giving them the power to hold, delegate, rent, and sell their property. These exclusionary land practices 
have evolved into a highly lucrative real estate market, controlled by an elite class of financial institutions and wealthy private investors with restricted government oversight. This is what Marx called the vulgar economy, virtually devoid of any socio-economic or cultural implications in exchange for financial proclivities through a competitive, profit-driven real estate market. Land values began to see substantial changes as economic geographies during Fordism were shaped by the emergence of nationalized markets and corporations and booming industries. This formation of mass production and consumption led to unprecedented material advancement of cities having received industrial legitimacy. The etchings of our earliest planned communities revealed the inherent inequalities of a land value system solely determined by capital output. Economic mobility became the major determinant of a city's built environment. Urban areas were subdivided along socioeconomic and racial lines to create designated spaces for businesses and wealthy merchants. Economic uncertainty also determined the location of the underclasses, who were unable to secure the same employment and living opportunities because of job scarcity, educational impediments, discrimination, and other barriers of entry. Landowners and high-paid workers reap the benefits of their material conditions, including better housing, education for their children, and overall quality of life. The division of high versus low-paid workers created a class divide, giving higher wage employees elevated social status and political power as part of the landowning class. These divisions often warranted different responses by local governments, depending on one's physical location within the city. As self-governing entities, cities have control over land use decisions like zoning and local infrastructure, but must uphold federal and state regulations that inform cities' policies. In addition to controlling public utilities like waste and water management, cities are also tasked with making public land and resource management decisions. Professional and municipal planners offer policy recommendations and design standards to address issues like population growth and sprawl, while city council and other administrative agencies oversee the city's functioning. Cities only receive partial funding from the federal government, requiring the rest of their operating costs to be financed by taxes. The revenues generated through taxes and fees determines how much money is allocated toward expenditures. Expenditures include everything from general maintenance to new city projects like public parks and community centers. Most of these tax models were designed to rely on the economic growth of the capitalist landowning class. The expansion of these classes was especially harmful to low-income areas of color, relegated to designated concentrated areas of poverty due to their discrimination from both employment and housing opportunities. In 1924, the National Association of Realtors' Code of Ethics even mandated that a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing members of any race whose presence will clearly be detrimental to any property in that neighborhood. No regulatory protections were offered in response to these discriminatory practices. Instead, these predominantly poor, non-white areas became the prime location for federally funded public housing complexes during the New Deal era. Residents in these inner city neighborhoods were entrapped by racist, federally backed housing policies and banking regulations known as redlining, keeping non-white and immigrant households from qualifying for mortgages in the suburbs. Exodus from the city led to a substantial decline in tax revenues creating even more austerity measures for inner-city neighborhoods. Most landholders and property owners divested from these areas, leaving residents in a perpetual state of rentership under substandard living conditions. These community members were not only stripped of the opportunity to build their own wealth through home ownership, but also forced to live in areas of blight. Some of their buildings were so neglected they became uninhabitable. Due to the state of decay of these dispossessed downtown areas, 
a nationwide model for redeveloping cities, known as the urban renewal movements, received federal funding to facilitate the process of wide-scale gentrification during the Reconstruction era. This billion-dollar initiative was part of the 1949 Housing Act and became known as slum clearing projects, as most subsidies went to demolishing extremely low-income communities in major cities for the purposes of revitalizing areas of blight or creating passage for the federal highway system. The program was intended to reduce substandard housing and de facto segregation that formed during the Red Line period. Federal loans were issued to municipal redevelopment authorities to purchase private land in areas designated for public housing. After demolition, cities sold this land on the private market at below market rates to incentivize purchases. Instead of rebuilding public housing, developers built commercial and residential spaces for middle-income families at a much higher market rate than what the original residents could afford. This led to the displacement of 300,000 residents across 600 cities and neighborhoods. Poor, inner-city, non-white communities lost their neighborhoods completely demolished for a road system so that suburbanites could get from their places into work. But this was still during the time that redlining was occurring. So literally, the federal highway system bulldozed these non-white communities and then said, sorry, you can't enter the suburbs, and literally left them with no fucking place to go. City and planning officials overlooked the impact of displacement to restore their tax bases depleted by suburban flights. A large portion of municipal budgets went to maintaining newly designed road networks connecting city corridors to freeways. Newly revitalized urban cores increased capital migration, which led to additional development for corporations and wealthy residents looking to establish themselves. Cities were becoming identifiable by their urban landscapes, cultural and tourist attractions, and the industries driving their economy. Finance capitalism was further expanded under Eisenhower with the institutionalization of real estate investment trusts giving stock market investors the opportunity to profit from future housing developments. By the 1970s, the debt security market established a new relationship between the federal government and sponsored enterprises, or GSCs, to mitigate losses from unpaid mortgages. Financial institutions used the assurance of government bailout to make riskier loans packaged and sold as mortgage-backed securities. The rise of technological advancement in the post-Fordism economy created even more opportunities for city expansion. Large real estate developers, private equity firms, and shareholders of real estate investment trusts continued to gain prominence as new tools for computing real estate valuation and market trends became available. Rapid growth in the real estate economy generated a new market for land speculation in urban neighborhoods. Traditional banking practices were used for land purchases, promising the highest return on investments. Profiteers collected substantial gains from these ventures once the value of land appreciated or increased in value. To maximize the profit motive in real estate finance, Wall Street used its lobbying power to oppose regulatory intervention. Federal housing policies designed to assist low-income households were still written to benefit the banking industry and private landholders, since they controlled most of the residential market. Failed desegregation attempts from the urban renewal movement were acknowledged during the civil rights era, calling for new housing opportunities to diversify the real estate market. The 1968 Fair Housing Act made it unlawful for a landlord to discriminate against members of the protected class. Landlords worked around this mandate with stringent financial requirements to deny housing to poor and marginalized groups. Record high inflation rates during the 1970s also led to landlords increasing rents to make up for the loss of their own purchasing power. In 1974, HUD introduced the Section 8 Housing Voucher Program, 
offering subsidies to private landlords in exchange for housing low-income tenants. Growing cities heavily promoted the program as a way to ameliorate housing disparities tied to racial discrimination and income inequality. But this program came up short for a couple of reasons. Landlords were not required to participate in the voucher program, which almost defeated the purpose of the program in the first place. Because of inadequate funding, the program did not guarantee a voucher to all eligible recipients, forcing applicants to continue renting in the private market while they await the lottery. Once individuals receive a voucher, they only have two to four months to find a unit with the participating landlord. Otherwise, they lose their voucher and must apply again. Ongoing racial disparities in home ownership led to Carter's Community Reinvestment Act of 1977, encouraging commercial banks and saving associations to reduce discriminatory lending practices. Relaxed qualification standards now apply to borrowers whose tenant and employment history typically yielded higher risks for mortgage defaults. While banks continued issuing high-risk loans or subprime mortgages, Congress passed the Alternative Mortgage Transactions Parity Act in 1982, allowing non-GSEs to issue adjustable rate mortgages. Lenders began to issue subprime mortgages at adjustable interest rates to low-income residents that weren't federally backed by a GSC. These mortgagees were not eligible for federal assistance or refinancing if they could not pay off their loan. These lending standards came during a time that professional planners and environmental activists began to reimagine our cities through the new urbanism movements. New urbanism's design strategies began to emerge in the late 1980s, advocating for the restructuring of urban spaces for more environmentally friendly, walkable neighborhoods. One of the major goals of new urbanism was to connect revitalized commercial districts to open public spaces accessible by various modes of transportation. Mixed-use development for multifamily housing and retail space radically shifted urban layouts, creating a greater demand for city living in these newly revitalized areas. Local businesses were disproportionately impacted by these corporate-based gentrification projects leaving only remnants of the previous district as a new one formed in its place. The formation of new urbanism coincided with the federal government's shift to neoliberal policies under Reagan, fundamentally rooted in the principles of free market capitalism and corporate privatization. A new sequence of economic precarities infiltrated the working class, starting with the decline of labor unions and subsequent bargaining power in the workplace. The rise of globalization led to outsourcing jobs to lower-wage countries, leaving millions of workers to find new employment. Exponential growth in the franchise industry created demand for more retail space and minimum-wage positions. Saving and loan associations took advantage of newfound banking deregulations with an excess of subprime commercial and residential mortgages. The issuance of risky mortgages caused rapid real estate speculation in low-valued markets. Debtors were unable to pay the adjusted interest on non-GSE subprime mortgages, leading to a mound of foreclosures. The value of these bank-owned properties was well below the cost of acquisition. Eventually, the saving and loan industry collapsed requiring a billion-dollar bailout from the federal government to keep private investment moving in the real estate economy. Shortly after the market crash, Clinton issued the second round of slum clearance initiatives, known as the HOPE 6 program. This federal grant package included funding to demolish remaining public housing stock from the New Deal era. Like the Urban Renewal Program, Cities sold the land back to the private market after demolition. A second portion of funding was devoted to cities' revitalization plans using new urbanism standards. Clinton's Qualified Housing and Work Responsibility Act was also established to transition tenants out of public housing and into the private market. After demolishing a sizable portion of public housing stock, Clinton introduced the Fair Cloth Amendment, placing a cap on the maximum number of housing units offered by HUD. 
budgetary shortfalls from HOPE 6 left some cities with a 30% decline in public housing, forcing expelled renters to find naturally occurring affordable housing in other impoverished neighborhoods. To be fair, the Congress of New Urbanism does not support gentrification. They promote the use of mixed income housing. Cities implementing these new design standards fail to replace low income housing lost from revitalization. Investor profits superseded plans to build mixed income housing, leaving few options for low income residents to re enter these spaces. As redeveloped areas began to encroach the boundaries of lower income communities, residents began to experience more police presence, leading to higher rates of police brutality. This second installment of state-sponsored gentrification overlapped with HUD's Housing and Community Development Acts, mandating that 30% of GSEs, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's loan purchases include mortgages to affordable housing recipients, the same residents who were either displaced or priced out of their own neighborhoods from new urbanism, now qualified for housing with similar price-to-rent ratios in the suburbs. Millions of families who were historically excluded from this market now had opportunities for home ownership. 40 years of deregulation in the financial industry led to newfound predatory lending practices targeting low-income borrowers that eventually created a massive housing bubble. Banks issued an unprecedented number of subprime mortgages with adjustable high interest rates. Borrowers were unable to make their payments after these adjustable rates kicked in, causing them to default on their loans. The 2008 subprime mortgage collapse received a quick response with the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act under George W. Bush, including $700 billion to purchase toxic assets, the foreclosed homes, from the banks. The global market collapse following the mortgage crash left millions of people without their jobs, pensions, and savings, causing 10 million people to lose their homes between 2006 and 2014. A third of homeowners were forced back into the rental housing market, which has been steadily growing since the 1960s. Part of this disparity was caused by the transfer in wealth that started in the early 1980s. Over the last 40 years, 11% of wealth accumulated by 90% of Americans has shifted to the top 10%, placing newfound cost burdens onto working class renters. A 2016 housing survey found that two thirds of respondents said they couldn't afford to own a home, while 20% preferred renting over buying. A study by Rent Cafe found that 74% more renters were living in cities today than in 1960 causing overall rental costs to rise by 36%. Concentrated wealth has also moved back into the city, as the number of renters making over $150,000 a year is double the number of homeowners making the same amount in the suburbs. Rental prices increase as more wealth is transferred back into the city, but costs rise even more in cities where demand outpaces supply. To put another way, Market logic assumes that if more housing units were available, more people would likely migrate into the city from other areas. In cities where supply is limited, the cost of housing is based on purchasing power, regardless of its general state or the value of its amenities. Case in point, a $3,000 apartment in San Francisco versus a $3,000 apartment in San Antonio. Congested cities struggle to make room for new housing, which have set incredibly high rents. But market analysis shows that even when more housing is built in these areas, the cost of rent is not eventually driven down. The opposite, in fact. New units with updated amenities are listed at a higher price to reflect the building's sophistication in a given market. These rates are determined by financial forecasts. Calculating the amount of rent that must be charged to cover development fees and investor profits in the short term. Surrounding apartment complexes start to make renovations to compete with these new buildings, creating a new cost index altogether. These units may be priced so high, they end up vacant 
appraised land value and property taxes in surrounding areas also begin to rise. Landlords offset these costs by increasing their own monthly rates. Tenants then pay higher rent without any changes in quality or amenity, leaving some renters cost burdened. The Department of Housing and Urban Development defines cost burden as paying 30% of income on housing, making it more difficult to afford necessities like food, clothing, transportation, and medical care. Severely cost burdened households pay 50% of their income on housing. As of 2019, there were 37 million cost burdened and 18 million severely cost burdened households in this country. Severely cost burdened households are most at risk for getting priced out of their own communities, an occurrence that is no longer unique to low income residents. Unfettered real estate values on top of rising income inequality is now causing housing insecurity for middle and even high income earners. Cities are now competing on a global scale to be the most accommodating, high functioning, technologically driven hub for industry growth. Real estate speculators also begin accommodating for the city's future transplants by making early investment for redevelopment in low cost areas. Current transplants may also opt to purchase homes in these neighborhoods as the only viable option to owning in exorbitant markets. Individual homeowners and speculators intentionally buy and renovate homes in these undervalued communities for eventual profit. This practice is known as sweat equity gentrification. Enough individual investors and speculators entering these communities can lead to corporate entities making large-scale investments known as land grabs if the return on their investment looks promising. Blackstone, one of the largest private equity firms in the world, is notorious for making these large-scale investments in up-and-coming neighborhoods. They use the liquid capital from their $325 billion portfolio to buy up multiple properties in devalued neighborhoods for renovations that go back onto the private market at a much higher rate. Who do you think bought up all of those bank-owned properties after the 2008 market crash? Divested neighborhoods within proximity of a central downtown core become the area of interest to begin the neighborhood flipping process. In the latest installment of state-sponsored gentrification, the Trump administration identified these neighborhoods as opportunity zones, offering tax breaks and low-interest loans to invest in these rundown, blighted areas. The Opportunity Zone program is postured to offer low-income residents job opportunities by incentivizing investors to purchase commercial real estate in divested neighborhoods. In reality, it's a low-interest loan scheme that was part of Trump's trillion-dollar tax reform bill, directing predatory investment into areas with low property values with the potential for high returns. So far, over 200 opportunity zones have been acquired by major banks and real estate companies, some of which having ties to Trump and Kushner business. The underwriting of opportunity zones will likely predict a similar outcome of urban renewal and new urbanism placing a cost burden on existing residents that eventually prices them out of their own neighborhoods. The federal government's commitment to neoliberal hegemonic practices has placed an extraordinary burden on local governments to resolve their housing crises formed by centuries of top-down austerity. Even though it's in a municipality's purview to protect residents most at risk for gentrification, the city's reliance on the capitalist class has exacerbated race and class struggles in underserved communities. As one of the city's major sources of revenue, capitalists have the power to demand a larger share of the city's distribution of goods and services, from capital improvement projects to new housing and other assurances that their business's physical locations are within the context of a clean, well-functioning public sphere. Amazon made these demands abundantly clear in 2017, with a public request for cities to compete for the opportunity to host its HQ2 headquarters. City proposals had to meet several requirements and preferences made by Amazon, including a location of headquarters between 30 minutes of a population center, proximity to mass transit, and airports offering direct flights to Seattle. <laughs> 
This prompted hundreds of cities to compete for the bid, offering billion-dollar tax breaks, expedited construction approvals, promises of infrastructure improvements, and crime reduction programs. To break this down, Amazon announced a sweepstakes for cities to drum up an incentive package levied by taxpayer dollars to convince Jeff Bezos why he should move his headquarters to their city. One year later, he, along with Starbucks and other Seattle-based companies, funded a campaign against city council's newly imposed tax on corporations largely responsible for massive migration into the city. Rapid population growth had destabilized the housing market, causing a significant increase in Seattle's homeless population. As the largest private employer in the city, this tax would have required Amazon to pay roughly $12 million a year. Instead of paying this tax, Amazon launched the No Tax on Jobs campaign, a ballot initiative to repeal city council's ruling. Before this happened, the body adjourned to reverse its own decision in a 7-2 split. One of the two members who voted against the appeal was Kashama Suwant, who Bezos personally attempted to remove from office by funneling $1.5 million into her political opponent's campaign. Council member Sawan is one of the only politicians who understands that the root cause of gentrification cannot be fixed under our current economic model. There is no market-based solution for the affordable housing crisis in most major cities. Price ceilings, vacancy taxes, and affordable housing vouchers won't stabilize the market as long as it's privately owned and driven by profit. The corporate class has so much power over the political process, they simply buy legislation to overturn government decisions by referendum. Once gentrification begins, little recourse is available for affected residents. There is no state-sponsored contingency plan for the displaced. There is no mandate requiring cultural or residential preservation for these communities. The disparities that capitalism and mid-century housing policies have caused in low-income, non-white communities have never been reconciled. Cities prioritize place-based capitalism over restorative justice, giving corporations and landowners disproportionate control over land use and community space. Normalizing this practice has created a revolving door of deprived communities considered to be just as disposable as the buildings they occupy. City councils hold public forums, allowing all residents to weigh in on the land use decision-making process. But these meetings only create the facade of diplomacy. The time and location of these meetings tend to be after regular business hours on weeknights, not compatible with working class schedules. Even if residents overcome the obstacles of getting to these public forums, fighting back against real estate developers, flippers, and corporate landlords vying for city land rarely results in a victory. Because working class neighborhoods have less political power, their interests are usually overlooked by city officials tasked with overseeing land use disputes. In 2018, Denver, Colorado's Community Action Network organized a summit after anti-gentrification protests formed in response to the chain Inc. Coffee advertising a sign reading, happily gentrifying the neighborhood since 2014. One organizer who was interviewed by a local news outlet responded to this impact of gentrification with, quote, as organizers of that original protest, we are turning our collective outrage into political power. The summit facilitated conversations around corporate responsibility, systemic accountability, developing affordable, accessible business opportunities, cultural preservation, and a celebration of resistance. Another community-based organization fighting to preserve neighborhoods in Brooklyn is led by Fifth Avenue Committee, or FAC, a coalition of over 200 advocates from neighborhood associations in the fields of community development and urban planning. Preservation efforts include rehabilitating older buildings and training local residents to own worker cooperatives in these newly renovated commercial spaces. The FAC also initiated their Displacement Free Zone campaign, protecting renters within a 36-block district 
who are most at risk for eviction. Policy solutions focused on community ownership could put more political power back into residents' hands. Campaigns for equitable distribution of municipal funds, including reparations for neglected schools, infrastructure, air and water supply, are legitimate grievances deserving adequate policy responses by local government officials. By building political agency, communities are better equipped to collectively represent their interests. This collectivist approach to socializing community space could also build momentum for future political action.